It is therefore one of the truly greatest honors of my life to welcome onto the stage Noam Chomsky. I want to slowly segue to the other part of your experience, and uh, which is, you wrote a wonderful essay called Language and Freedom. Um, before I get there, though, it seems to me what the motivation to study language was to understand something which you often talk about as human nature. I was going to ask you what, I, I still don't quite know what human, the word means, the phrase means human nature, but, but you seemed attractive attracted to the notion that understanding human nature would help us understand social interactions, an issue that, was, that has been and clearly is very important to you when you get there. And, and you were attracted and written a lot about Rousseau. Now, I remember Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau had a big impact on me when I read him, The Social Contract, because of that famous phrase, man is born free but lives forever in chains, which, which took me a long time to understand. And, um, but, but but Rousseau had this idea, which, which in your writing you've uh, uh, repeated a number of times, that somehow the natural state of man, and we'll just use man for that moment here, um, uh, is a good one. And somehow society screws that up. So, for example, you wrote, um, actually at the time of American draft resistors, you were saying um, uh, many who were beginning to recover from the catastrophe of 20th century Western civilization which is so tragically confirmed Rousseau's judgment. And he wrote, here arose the national wars, battles, murders, and reprisals, which make nature tremble and shook reason, and all those horrible prejudices which rank the honor of shedding human blood among, among the virtues. The most decent men learned to consider it one of their duties to murder their fellow man. At length, men were seen to massacre each other by the thousands without knowing why. More murders were committed on a single day of fighting and more horrors in the capture of a single city than were committed in the state of nature during whole centuries over the entire face of the earth. Now, is that really... Uh, it seems to me that that's wrong. <laughs> well, that's Rousseau. <laughs> yeah, it's Rousseau, but I yeah. mean, you quoted it. And the question I is, do you agree it. with that? I mean, it seems to me that, in fact, one of your former colleagues, Steve Pinker, has written a book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, that in fact... If you wanted to choose a time to be around and have a happy, nonviolent life, today is a lot better than, than when you're being, being around at Neanderthal times. Well, that's what he claims, but the weight of evidence is strongly against it. You think so? Uh, I think so. There's very good work by a serious anthropologist, Brian Ferguson is one, who's worked through his data and I think shown that it's probably wrong for about 95% of human existence, namely the hunter-gatherer periods. It's really with the emergence of state systems, the development of complex agriculture, they begin to get wars that are very destructive. I mean, there's killing among hunter-gatherers, you know, but it's pretty limited. But there has been moral progress, in fact, you wrote. But, well, one um, thing that he says is correct. Uh -huh. I think that's about it. Uh, <laughs> since. Since the, uh, since the Enlightenment, there has been moral progress. Uh, in our own lifetimes, there's been moral progress. So consider, for example, uh, the status of women's rights today and in 1950. Very different. The status of civil rights, very different. The gay rights, very different. That's progress. And it's been going on slowly since the Enlightenment. But that's a pretty brief period of human history. It's, and in fact, right at this same time have been the most murderous, destructive uh, wars ever. And even the 70 years ago, the creation by some of the smartest people in the world of an, uh, a device that may destroy us all and is on the verge of destroying us we'll, we'll get to that. As you know, I'm, I'm the chairman of the board of the Atomic Scientists. It's an issue that's really of great interest to me. You actually just 
produced a quote I was going to talk about for you, is it, that, there, that there has been moral progress in many ways, status of women in particular, you talk about your daughters versus your grandmother, but it, and you say it's fairly brief, but don't you think it's interesting that that coincides with the rise of science? Do you think that's coincidental? No, it's not coincidental. Part of the con contribution of the Enlightenment was to free inquiry from constraints uh, which led to the rise of science. So breaking free of these fetters that society had imposed uh, uh, did permit the rise of science, uh, did permit moral progress, uh, also permitted massive destruction. Well, now we're going to get to the massive destruction, and you're interested in that. It, it, you wrote at one point, and, and the transition in this, lang in this lang uh, language and freedom, which is really trying to understand what, whether your scientific and intellectual background somehow motivated, in some sense, your social activism. I mean, it's, it's, I like to believe that the intensive study of one aspect of human psychology, human language, may contribute to a humanistic social science that will serve as well as an instrument for social action. This is a kind of a, a connection, not a logical connection, nothing you can prove, uh, just a suggestive relation. And it shows up in Rousseau. So if you take a look at, say, uh, the uh, work of Rousseau that I quoted, which is the second discourse on equality, that's his most mm -hmm. libertarian writing. Yeah. He begins with a pretty strictly Cartesian view uh, of uh, animals as being machines, just reflexive machines uh, compelled to do what they do uh, by internal and external circumstances without, uh, the, uh, without the creative character of human thought and behavior. Uh, and uh, he then says, again in roughly Cartesian terms, that what is unique and distinctive about humans is this internal creative capacity. That's what makes humans different from the rest of the natural world. Then comes a thesis, which is not proved, but I think is plausible, namely any social arrangements that inhibit or constrain that free creative capacity uh, are fundamentally illegitimate unless they can justify themselves. That means any structure of authority, domination, hierarchy, uh, whether it's in a patriarchal family or in international affairs or anything in between, should be subject to challenge. It's not self-justifying. There's... <laughs> and, uh, Uh, I mean, you can see the chain of thinking. Notice it's not a proof, but beginning with the observation that specific to human nature, a term which I don't object to, we maybe could talk about that. Yeah. Uh, inherent to human nature, what's special about us, uh, is this uh, creative character, the, uh, the, free, the uh, need to inquire, to create, to uh, act, to choose what you do, to, uh, how you speak, how you interact, and so on. The, there's, a ch there's kind of a, a chain of thinking from that to the conclusion that, so, and which is in Rousseau, in fact, that uh, the social structures which inhibit that uh, are illegitimate unless proved otherwise. Like sometimes you can give an argument in favor of authority. So if I'm walking down the street with, say, my three-year-old granddaughter and she runs into the street and I grab her arm and pull her back, I think I can give a justification for that. But the point is that any, the argument is that any form of authority and domination requires justification. And usually you can't justify it, in which case you have to um, dismantle it and replace it by something more free and just. Oh, this That's is perfect. It's a great segue. This mm -hmm. is perfect. Yeah. By the way, I want to let the people backstage know that we're going, going to go a little long. Instead of an, an, we're going to go about 15 minutes longer than intended, and the reason is I want to. Um, <laughs> so I made a choice. Okay. Uh, 
but how did so how did live you with make, it? How did you make this? <laughs> <laughs> it's such power. So, what do we do? What we do is uh, recognize that people like us, I suspect virtually all of us, are a privileged minority. Mm -hmm. We do have unusual freedom by comparative standards. You know, there's plenty you can criticize about the country, but by comparative standards, it's very free. Uh, the ability of the state to repress and constrain is quite limited for anybody who has a degree of privilege. Now, it's not true if you happen to be a black kid in the slums, uh, but uh, for people like us, you know, people who've gone through college who are relatively well off, you know, have the, have the resources, have the time, have the access to the internet, have plenty of opportunities, uh, I think that uh, yields conclusions about what we ought to be doing. I mean, quite generally, uh, privilege confers opportunity, and opportunity uh, it confers responsibility, and responsibility means uh, dedication to challenging, questioning uh, uh, the uh, verities that are imposed on us by doctrinal systems and uh, uh, structural arrangements that uh, are based on hierarchy and domination. And working, not only challenging them, but doing something about it. Uh, and to the degree that you have privilege, there's more that you can do. I think that's just as simple as that. And again, I think a five-year-old would understand it. Well, I told you, we're in that. Mm -hmm.